So welcome to the podcast. Uh, could you please tell our audience your name and the name of your company? Hey, James, my name's Greg Safran, and I, I work for Safety Integration. That's the name of the company. So I understand that you're in the loss prevention and uh, safety consulting industry. Could you tell me what uh, got you interested in that? Uh, it's a long story, so I'll give you the short version because I know we're, we're on a time limit. Um, basically, I have a degree in geology, and I worked for almost 15 years in the geology side of the consulting business um, with a company called Groundwater Environmental Services, GES. did a lot of work for some big companies like DuPont and Exxon Mobil. Uh, I traveled all over the, all over the country uh, working for those guys on some big sites, and uh, we did a lot of our own safety because we were small and starting up. Now GES is a force to be reckoned with. They're grown so quickly, and they're a gigantic company. Um, still a fantastic company, um, but we had to put everything in place. So it was one of those deals where like, hey, we need a safety guy. Your uh, region, nobody ever seems to get hurt. Why is that? And I said, well, I do all the training. We talk about stuff. It's all hands-on, and we hold everybody accountable. I don't have time to, to have people get hurt because we have so much work going on. Um, so I kind of volunteered into the safety game and learned it on the fly, taking some training classes at Exxon, doing some training class at DuPont, going to get some extra hours, uh, the training at, you know, like the National Safety Council does a bunch of uh, like the advanced safety certificates. So I did, I did classes there. And then just years of handling um, issues. Somebody would get hurt, a piece of equipment would break and you're missed. Um, while I was doing it, one day the vice president of the company called and said, hey, uh, do you know anything about a work comp claim, how to handle it? And I said, I can learn, let's figure it out. Because we had a bad one. Um, and we suspected it was fake. So I jumped into it and started working with the claims adjuster uh, and learned a lot about how to handle claims from, from doing it that way. So that's the really short version, believe it or not, of how I kind of did safety while I was doing geology all over the place. Wow. So like what got you into geology? You know, what was your uh, interest there? Man, I'm telling you, it's, I love it. It's probably the greatest job I've ever had. Um, the reason I switched to what I do is I was never home. I traveled a ton and I started to have a, a young family. Um, but what got me into geology, man, is just being able to be outside and the equipment that you get to play with mm -hmm. is awesome. So if you're going to pay me to be on a huge drill rig and dig in the dirt and play in the mud, I'm in because I would do that for free. Sure. I mean, I mean, th that beats, you know, say sitting at the desk for 12 hours a day. Uh, I, I can imagine how that, you know, because I, I know people out there who are just, like, hey, um, like my dad works at Ford and uh, he had a, a coworker who was in the military and he got a job there and uh, he quit because he could not be indoors working in the plant. Uh, he actually started his own uh, tree uh, pruning company. Nice. But uh, I was going to say, uh, you know, according to uh, Sheldon Cooper, of the Big Bang Theory, geology isn't a real science anyway. So, you know, you <laughs> may have you know, dodged a bullet there and, you know, yep. going into the safety uh, type of uh, field. Yeah, we, we hear that stuff all the time, the <laughs> geologists versus the engineers. Mostly the time that was the geologists bailing out the engineer. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> it depends what side of the rock you're standing on, I guess. <laughs> well, yeah, there you go. I, I guess you have a little bit of leverage, you know? <laughs> yeah, just a little. Oh, boy. So, uh, so the name of your company is Safety. Um, and, well, I was going to say, it's spelled S-A, little a-F-T. Could you tell us what that stands for? Yeah, that's, um, that's the program that over the years of uh, learning on the fly and handling issues as they came up and just kind of documenting everything. Um, when we'd be out drilling, we'd write everything in a book. So I kind of carried that into um, all the safety stuff I was doing. I'd make notes on everything. And then I realized, man, I'm pretty good at figuring this stuff out. Like what's going on, how to fix it, what works, what doesn't. And I'd trial and error because I had no idea. I didn't go to school for that side of the game. Um, so safety – over the years became four things you have to control to have a great safety program. And it's a mashup of safety programs from all over the country, but I wanted to make it easy for smaller businesses and mid-sized businesses to do. Cause a lot of times you don't have a full-time safety person. So what do you have to have to make your safety program work? And the best answer in the world is supervisor. That's the S in safety. And it's a capital cause it is the most important part. Yes. You have to have a commitment from the top, from the owners, but if you have a supervisor crew and leaders that understand safety, like they are the safety guy, the rest is simple. Their job is to make sure the employees that work for them go home safe at the end of the day. 
So you start with your supervisors, the boots on the ground, and you have to train them up. You have to make sure they understand safety rules, why safety guys say the things they do, why OSHA wants things documented the way they want it, why insurance companies want investigations, what a near miss is, all the stuff that can make life easier that a lot of people that become supervisors have never been trained on or supported with or just told they have to do it, never really coached, so to speak, to get them there. The A is accountability. In any program, in any walk of life, and anything that's going on, hell, maybe right now in America, we could use a little bit of accountability. All the protests, everything that's going on, there's just so much I don't even want to talk about. But accountability is everything, and that is the willingness to accept responsibility. So when you have a safety program, whose who's problem is it or whose job is it to make sure that people don't get hurt? And the answer is simple. You, the employee, the person, and the supervisor all working together to make sure that you go home at the end of the day. So building accountability is the trick in what we do. Um, and it takes time. It's like respect. You have to build it. You have to earn it. You have to gain it. It's about communication. It's about getting people involved. So the accountability can take time or it can be a light switch depending on scenarios and things that might happen while you're building your program f is frequency and everybody instantly knows the frequency of the injuries and the severity of the injuries well it's a lot more than that it's the frequency of call offs turnover no shows bad product giving your equipment downtime um, we really dig into everything that causes accidents and injuries and in, in maybe in a manufacturing facility or on a construction site or on a drill rig um, even at hospitals or care facilities what your number one cause of injuries are. Why? What's going on? How come this continues to happen? How come, you know, six guys got their fingers cut off last year running that piece of equipment? And we really dig into it. It might be a bad piece of equipment. It might be bad material. It could be people making mistakes. Who knows? It could be a whole bunch of different things. That's why we dig into it. So we always look in the, in the past, right? History, if you pay attention to it, don't let it repeat itself. You can learn a ton of stuff just like right now. All right. It's, we've seen this kind of stuff in the United States before history is repeating itself and it's, it sucks. All right. So same, we don't want it to repeat itself over and over and over where people get hurt. So we really dig into frequency and we help explain it to the owners and supervisors and understand, Hey, there's a reason we're asking for all this information. There's a reason OSHA looks at days away restricted time or also known as the dart rate. And then the last thing that safety stands for the capital T that's training. Um, and right now, it's hard because hands-on training is the way to go. Most people that work for a living want to touch, see, feel, and learn quick. With everybody's att attention span nowadays, you can't do a four-hour, eight-hour, all-day safety thing and expect people to remember it. You couldn't before. That, hey, we're going to shut down and do the eight-hour safety day, never a fan. I'd sit in that thing, and 10 minutes in, I was looking at my email. I was, you know, writing on the desk, throwing stuff at the guy in front of me, whatever I was doing. To pay attention for eight hours and remember all that stuff, not easy, even more so now. So it's quick to the point, like tailgate safety talks, um, toolbox safety talks. You can make up the name, whatever you want to do, but constant, short safety burst. Hands-on, though, 